Um, next presentation, then, we move forward is by uh, Morgan Neesmith with Burkle, who is going to talk about uh, a project uh, associated with the Kansas City Airport expansion. Morgan, the floor is yours. Okay, good uh, Good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Morgan Neesmith. Uh, I am uh, the Director of Engineering for Berkel & Company. And um, we're a uh, design, build, uh, geotechnical contractor and, and specializing in deep foundations and ground improvement. And that's why we were uh, involved in this particular project. Uh, it was put out um, as a design build uh, for the foundations. And that's what we're going to go over um, today. So we're, the, the, the new Kansas City Airport, we'll talk about the construction scope uh, of what they were they're intending to build uh, is still under construction. Uh, we'll look at the foundation scope and particularly the range of loads and uh, pile sizes that were expected, um, the soil conditions. We'll touch on just a little bit of what an auger cast pile is. I think most people are probably familiar, but just in case anyone uh, is not, I may use the term auger pressure grouted or APG pile. Um, that's synonymous. It's a sort of a subset um, that uses uh, more than a sand uh, cement size of particles in, a, in their grout. And then we'll look at the load test program um, that really allowed us to uh, optimize the final production recommendations um, and optimize the efficiency of the system for the owner. So this is a, a shot from a couple of years ago of the what the Kansas City Airport looked like in 2019 before uh, the new construction started. So we have the main control tower, uh, and then we have three separate terminals, A, B, and C, which for anyone who's flown in and out of Kansas City, they're very, very easy to get in and out of these terminals, um, as opposed to me being from Atlanta and spending hours and hours going through security and uh, TSA and things like that. It's it's pretty easy to get in and out of your, your, uh, your terminals here, but they are all separated, and that presents uh, some challenges. So along with just generally upgrading uh, the facilities, uh, they wanted to combine uh, the, the facilities into to one uh, one new terminal. So the uh, plan was to demolish Terminal A, and that actually happened a couple of years prior to uh, when we started putting in foundations in 2019, uh, and then build this new uh, combined terminal uh, here with the new entranceway. Uh, and everything here. Um, so eventually, Terminal B and C were still in, are still in use, but will eventually be demolished as they uh, start to use the new, uh, the new terminal. Uh, this is actually a new parking deck as well that's associated with the, uh, the new terminal. However, uh, we're going to focus mainly on the terminal that were technically two separate projects. Um, so this is an artist's rendition of what the new terminal. Uh, will look like when they're completed. And this is just a sort of an overview of what sort of structure we're talking about. By and large, the main uh, portions of the terminal uh, and entranceway were uh, an steel, steel uh, roof framing with cantilevered columns. Uh, there were also some steel braced frames uh, in some of the uh, some of the uh, more heavily loaded areas as well. Uh, and this is really just to illustrate, and it, it does, hasn't come out so clearly here, but we're we're working, let's say, uh, we're calling top of uh, working grade is right about at, a, at, a, at a elevation 100 for the site. And we were working anywhere from uh, uh, about 10 feet below, I'm sorry, elevation 1,000. We're really working at about uh, uh, 10 feet below grade. Um, so 990 to somewhere in the 985 uh, range for top of pile at uh, some of these other uh, color areas. And just the range of, of foundations, uh, some very lightly loaded uh, columns in the middle of some of the terminals with only a couple of piles, and then some of the more heavily loaded uh, larger diameter piles uh, around the, uh, the edges of the building. So the column loads ranged such that uh, they might have anywhere from only 20 tons uh, to up to uh, 1,400 or so tons uh, on, on the column, and, and that sort of presented uh, one challenge was, you know, you know how are we going to 
design. It's not really a one size fits all. We're talking about an order of magnitude difference uh, between the loads. So it, uh, the construction self schedule though lent itself to using multiple rigs on the site, which then meant we would we could use multiple diameter um, size piles. There was actually a pre-construction uh, or a pre-bid uh, test pile program performed with a couple of tests uh, each in the um, the new terminal close to the new terminal location and the new proposed uh, parking deck uh, before any uh, um, before the majority of the demolition was done and that information had been provided to all of the bidding teams or the bidding uh, companies uh, to help uh, but the, the ultimately the uh, specialty contractor was responsible for uh, the, both the design, final design, and the load test verification program. And this is just another example of uh, one of the other areas of the uh, the facility and the, the range of columns, including some uh, very heavily uh, laterally loaded columns, um, which were really uh, driving some of the, the 24 inch pile design. Uh, by and large, those were not uh, having, we were not putting the maximum load we could have put on. Uh, those piles from a structural standpoint in compression, but they were required to resist uh, some of the lateral loads that uh, they were generated by the by the structure. Uh, I thought just as a as a designer working for a, a design build contractor, they, they had relatively good coverage. There were a couple of different phases of the site investigation and, and really captured the range of uh, conditions fairly well um, so that you see the borings uh, in the proposed uh, terminal layout here and what we have over here is a generalization of the soil profile and one of the things to note would be that yeah this is technically about right in terms of the lowest depth of say the existing fill or the lowest depth of the native clay so that um, the, the longest depth we might install a pile to get to some potential bearing layer in either the weak or strong shale or possibly even the limestone. Uh, and in a uh, more traditional uh, design approach, uh, say 10, 15, 20 years ago, we might have said, okay, we're going to take that worst case condition and design for that and all of the piles will be designed based on that. Uh, but uh, really, the, there were a range of depths, uh, anywhere from, uh, say, to 30 to about 55 or 60 feet um, of the existing fill, for example. So, capturing that range of uh, depths and thicknesses of the various strata um, was part of the uh, final design approach in terms of optimizing the foundation design. Uh, so, again, the, the decision had uh, been made based on the original geotechnical investigation uh, that the auger cast piles would probably be the most efficient approach. And again, there was a pre bid load test program performed. But just for those who aren't familiar, um, auger uh, pressure grounded piles or auger cast in place piles are, are crane mounted uh, typically in North America. Uh, there is a uh, set of swinging leads that is supported uh, by a, trad technical, a traditional crawler crane. Uh, a power pack is typically attached to the back of the crane, which drives uh, all of the hydraulics, the rotation of the gearbox, the gearbox and the swivel are what go uh, up and down the leads, and the continuous flight auger is attached to the gearbox and is rotated into the ground, and then uh, grout is pumped under pressure up to the top of the hollow stem, of the, uh, through the gearbox into the hollow stem of the auger, and the piles are crowded as they come out of the ground. So again, have the power pack attached to just a standard crawler crane. Uh, the gearbox, um, and the size of the gearbox in this case was on the larger end. Uh, we were looking at uh, 80 to 90 foot uh, maximum drill lengths. Um, the weight of the gearbox was also relatively heavy in this case. That's important because that's part of the weight that's driving the downward force since it is a crane mounted system. There is no external force to be applied uh, to force the, the tool down. So the weight of the equipment is really what forces the, the tool downwards as the rotation allows. And then this, again, this is an example of a grout pump. Um, ready mix trucks uh, deliver grout to the site and they're pumped under pressure 
uh, through two to 300 feet of, of uh, flexible hose up to the top of the hollow stem auger. Um, most of the auger cast files that are installed today um, are include automated monitoring systems. Uh, and the, typically what you would see on those systems are uh, depth sensors, uh, flow meters to monitor grout flow, and hydraulic fluid pressure sensors uh, to monitor the grout or the uh, rotations and uh, the pressure that's required to, to drive the rotation rate uh, of the, uh, the tooling. Typically this is displayed in the cab and these days is often uh, displayed wirelessly uh, so that uh, inspectors and uh, the installers can, can both monitor this equipment in real time uh, as they're installing files. Um, this helps in a site like this where we might expect to encounter certain stratum uh, at certain depths. The operator, besides just the general feel of the, the drilling equipment, um, uh, can, can see in real time, and particularly for the inspector who doesn't necessarily have that same feel, they're not operating the equipment, but they can see some of the resistances uh, picking up as more power or torque is required to uh, drill certain, certain layers. Uh, and again, we have, along with manual inspection records, uh, the uh, automatically generated inspection records. Uh, this is a typical record where um, versus parameters versus time that are produced are uh, the depth as they drill and then withdraw the tooling. Uh, what we call here the KDK pressure, which is the fluid pressure that drives the rotation of the tooling. You can see that it's relatively uh, high during uh, penetration and then not nearly as, uh, as high during withdrawal as you might expect. And then in this case, the grout flow casting the pile. So once the maximum depth is reached, uh, the grout flow begins. And uh, again, from a quality control standpoint, you can make, see that it's relatively uh, consistent throughout the withdrawal rate. Uh, and then versus plotting those parameters versus depth, you can get penetration and withdrawal rates. Uh, again, that hydraulic fluid pressure driving the turntable the flow rate of the grout, the rotation rate of the uh, tooling, and the incremental grout factors that are put in every, I'd say, three to five foot increment uh, of the pile as you're withdrawing the tooling. So when we're designing structural pile, uh, APG piles, um, we're limited structurally by uh, IVC, uh, which, this particular aspect hasn't changed since 2009. That's why it's referenced. So the limits on the pile, regardless of steel reinforcing, are 30% uh, of the uh, unconfined compressive strength of the grout. So say traditionally, a lot of people think 4,000 PSI grouts readily available. Uh, these might be the limits we might be looking at for uh, a certain diameter pile size. Uh, the reality is when these days across the country, say at least 6,000 PSI is, I would say, consistently available across the country. And then in certain areas, even uh, higher grout strengths are consistently available. And what that does is in an, in an environment like this, where we have a, a refusal quality or a very stiff uh, bearing layer, like uh, the drillable shale or the limestone underneath the shale uh, that we showed earlier, you can start to maximize um, the, 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 these higher structural limits that the higher grout strength provides uh, you, you to, to use uh, for different diameters. So the eventual proposal um, and one other aspect of the uh, that the project team was hoping uh, that the proposals would address was uh, there were some uh, areas that were available uh, typically uh, these portions of the the terminal of the proposed new terminal that were available to start drilling immediately, uh, but there was some demolition in these areas, uh, particularly down in the in the southern area um, of the old uh, facilities. Uh, that if demolition had of the entire site had been, we were waiting for demolition of the entire site to to, to start construction, um, that would have caused a significant delay to the project. So the hope was that. Uh, we could uh, an approach could be developed that we would start uh, with the available areas uh, in the north uh, and then address the other areas uh, as they became available. 
Uh, and really, again, because of the range of loads and the range of sizes we wanted to use the, the construction schedule, we, we elected to divide the site <clears throat> into zones uh, according to the borings that we've had available uh, and, and develop design models for different areas uh, of the facility. And then the proposal was to do a more extensive load test program. Um, and, and I'll talk about that, the, the exact proposal uh, on the next slide, I think. The proposal was to do an, a more extensive load test program to sort of verify the parameters for each or uh, verify and let's say finalize the parameters for each of the individual sections as the project progressed, as opposed to just picking say a worst case model and doing a handful of tests to verify that model um, across the site. So what we were looking at as uh, was a, an additional cost of $300,000 for the load testing. Um, and for what we were offering the owner in the production was about a 10% reduction in production pile costs by what we thought was using the sites, the, the variability across the site um, and, and setting different production lengths uh, for piles across the site based on these individual models per area that were then gonna be verified by their individual load tests. Um, that would also allow us to go right into production after the completion of the first set of load tests and then finalize the models for the other sections as those sections became available. So this was the original program um, for a site like this that has about, uh, I think it was 23, might have actually been up to 2,500 piles all told. Um, that has a relatively consistent, uh, let's say a bearing zone, of, you know, that, again, that uh, drillable shale to limestone. We might expect to see four to five load tests on a traditional, the traditional approach, say, a rough rule of thumb of one test per four or 500 uh, production piles. And what we were proposing uh, was was much more extensive. We were proposing at least 15 total um, compression tests and then a handful of uh, lateral tests as well. Um, the lateral tests really were just to economize potentially the, the reinforcing design uh, based on or uh, from what we had, had anticipated from the available soil parameters, uh, but the, it was the compression testing um, across the site, which was really proposed to either verify or again adjust uh, and economize the model, uh, the, the final design models across the site and set production pile links for the various pile sizes um, for each individual section of the facility as it became available. Um, so again, this is the range of, of the tests that were done at each of the locations. Uh, typically, they were matched up to the boring that we, we felt most uh, illustrated the uh, design profile in that site or in that area of the of the facility, and then we adjusted them in those models based on the results of the test. Uh, I'm going to look at two different tests that we did here in the middle of the site. Uh, both 16-inch diameter piles to different uh, to different depths. Uh, and I want to say before we get into this, I wanted to just reiterate uh, everything uh, Mrs. Dawson had, had said about her comments about load testing, from testing to twice past twice design uh, to uh, using more uh, quick using your time to do more quick load tests than any sorts of holds as a as a company that we probably do 250 to 300 load tests a year and uh, the, all everything uh, that she said I, I we, we have seen that over the years as well that um, we're getting much more information by doing by, by skipping cycles and extended hold times and using set the quick load test method uh, or um, set uh, standard increments uh, and allowing the, the loads to, to settle out at, at a drink increment uh, with our instrument load tests. Um, so all that aside, we did, this was a test that was installed to 55 feet, which in the area that we were talking about uh, was really only about 20, uh, 15 to 20 feet into the native uh, 
clays uh, that underlie the fill in, in that particular area of the site and um, just barely touched what was known as the weak shale uh, in that area. Uh, and in this particular case, we have a, a good bit of uh, a good bit of load up to 300 tons. At that point, unfortunately, we were testing these piles uh, within a week after um, production time, or sorry, they were they were cast. And in this particular case, uh, ended up breaking the pile. And we can talk later if anybody has any questions about how I believe I know that that's a structural failure and not a geotechnical failure. Um, and then, but if we extrapolate uh, the geotechnical data or extrapolate what the assumed uh, portion of the curve up to the where we started to have a structural problem with the pile, um, and in this particular case, use the modified Davison limit, see an ultimate load of about 380 tons. And I, I don't illustrate it here, uh, but using the Butler Hoy method, um, which there was a, a, a DFI paper that Armin Studelein uh, wrote, uh, it's been about four or five years now, uh, where he, he uh, recommended the Butler Hoy method for hard cast in place piles, uh, for not taking the failure as the best estimation for ultimate load. In that case, that was also about 380 tons. And then we contrast that with the 78 foot pile. So this was put in through the weak and uh, stiffer shale or stronger shale uh, down to refusal on the underlying limestone. Uh, it's possible that there's a refusal in a very strong shale, but for all intents and purposes from a design standpoint at that point, it was the main issue was it was either refusal quality shale or the underlying limestone. Um, so we were, we were actually hitting uh, a tool refusal. Uh, and this is pretty typical of what we see for augered piles installed through uh, a very stiff uh, bearing layer uh, and, and into practical refusal, a relatively linear um, load displacement curve, uh, in this case up to the maximum load of just over 380 tons. Uh, predominantly elastic, and then again seeing almost all of that uh, pile head deflection uh, recovered once the pile is unloaded. Uh, and comparing the the load distribution charts uh, for the first uh, for the 55 foot load test, what we were most interested in was really the the soil and weak rock below 35 feet in this case, and because again the basic approach of uh, We'll just install everything to refusal. That would have been a much more ex expensive, uh, expensive uh, approach. And so it was really the, the whole idea behind these programs was to refine um, the design models for the weak uh, shale and the upper stiff clay above the shale, so that particularly uh, very lightly loaded 12-inch piles or some of the more lightly loaded 16-inch piles uh, could sit in that native uh, clay. Uh, or in just touching the weaker limestone, uh, as opposed to having to go into the deeper, uh, stronger limestone. Um, again, unfortunately, the 55-foot pile, uh, we think uh, we're fairly certain broke uh, during testing. We didn't really max out the shaft resistances in the lower portion, but these are getting into the 1.2 TSF uh, unit shaft resistance. Uh, but what we did see in the uh, the 78 foot pile is in that same range, uh, really getting uh, values that were closer to 1. T, uh, 1.5 TSF. And that was really important because those are, are higher than uh, the published values that we see for uh, native clays uh, in most in any published values that I've seen, um, except once you get into, as you move further north in the Midwest into heavily over consolidated tills. So the till soils, you might see uh, higher uh, design values for nominal shaft resistance of the clay, uh, but we don't see much over 1.1, 1.2 TSF as recommended maximum design value. So, <coughs> pardon me, again, going back to testing above potentially two times, just two times design, really trying to put either the most load we can on the pile or actually failing uh, the pile to really uh, get some of these values um, that are we're, we're starting to see on a regular basis outstrip what are in the 
current design models. Um, and this is a 24 inch diameter test uh, that was installed to 62 feet. Um, and in that same area, actually right in the middle of the, uh, the, the middle of the uh, project. And installed, so in this case, uh, instead of just tagging the weak shale, uh, drilled about five feet or so into the, uh, the weaker shale, but not all the way to, uh, uh, to refusal. Um, and then that was tested, pardon me, uh, up to a maximum load of about 800 tons, which there, there were only a handful of piles that were uh, over 300 tons uh, compression load. Uh, the majority of the 24 inch piles were closer to the 100 to 150 ton compression load. And they would have been handled by 16 inch piles had there not been for these extensive lateral loads uh, that were uh, 20 to 25 tons per pile. Uh, but again, seeing the, the uh, strength, the load distribution along the shaft of the pile uh, with the instrument and strain gauges and getting these design values uh, from that load test. Uh, so that in that particular area, uh, setting the final length of the 24 inch diameter piles uh, based on these shaft resistances that we were seeing uh, in the native soils and the weaker, uh, the weaker shale just below the native soils. And so that's really the approach that we took was that in every location, as we were able to complete the load tests in that particular location, we went on a column by column basis and set a toe elevation for every column. Um, that it, it took maybe a good bit more testing to do that uh, upfront, but that upfront cost you can see, again, shaved about 10% off the overall construction cost as well as allowing us to go into production immediately as opposed to waiting for the entire site to be available. Um, and again, setting each, uh, it also requires a little bit more, um, uh, let's say oversight quality control, as opposed to just telling a field crew to say, go into drill till you can't drill anymore. Um, having, you know, really uh, to pay attention. So there are, you know, additional requirements in terms of uh, maybe your crew and quality control. One of the advantages of those automated monitoring systems, though, is you can put in uh, target levels on a pile by pile, pile basis uh, as well uh, to give the operator an indication that they're getting to the, the target toe elevation um, at each pile. Uh, but that, again, was the, the final design approach was a, a tip elevation or pile toe elevation was set uh, for every column location as we completed each uh, set of pile load tests uh, for each individual section of the project. And again, for, uh, similarly, again, for the lateral load test, uh, we did perform uh, 24 inch uh, load tests uh, up to about 50 tons uh, maximum uh, lateral load. Uh, and that was used, uh, I'm a little, I'm not a, a little skeptical, I would say, is uh, from using a single freehead lateral test uh, to, to, to uh, um, predict the behavior of a group of, of piles that are fixed head and 10 feet below ground or whatever. Uh, it's, but it really, I guess it's uh, some of the best information we have available to us uh, today. And so we would take these, uh, the results of these tests, particularly up to the design load of about 20 to 25 tons and look at the movement and the predicted movement of a single pile at the ground surface uh, freehead uh, and adjust the upper soil parameters uh, to then use uh, for L pile or group models of uh, six to eight to nine piles, um, their pile heads anywhere between again, 50 or sorry, five to 12 feet uh, below grade. And that did allow us to um, reduce the final design of the reinforcing uh, from the original base uh, and again to economize the foundation design. Oh, pardon me. Okay, so that is that is really all I have. This is a picture that I just pulled off the, uh, the internet. I believe it's from April and that just shows the state of the uh, the construction so far. So all of the foundations were completed in 2000, 
Uh, by the end of 2019, I think in 2020, we, uh, we were installing the foundations for the garage. So you can see the, the new, the north part of the new uh, terminal uh, is being constructed and uh, they're a little bit, uh, they also closing in on at least getting the exterior completed for the southern portion of the, uh, the terminal as well. And that uh, again completes the, uh, the presentation uh, for me. Thank you. Hey Morgan, thank you very much.